Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Lewis Showers coming to you from Grace Baptist Church in Washington, Indiana. Today, of course, is Good Friday. And Good Friday is the day that most of us as Christians take a few minutes to remember what our Lord did those 2,000 years ago when they nailed him to the cross and he suffered during those few hours before the Passover began that evening. This was no ordinary crucifixion. For one thing, the man who was, laying, who was placed on the cross was totally innocent. He had not committed any crimes. In fact, he was suffering in the place of one of the most notorious of criminals of that day and time. But his work on the cross was no accident. It had been planned out ages before this event. And Jesus, in all that took place, was in full control of everything. Nothing happened to Jesus from the time he was betrayed to the time he said it is finished and he gave up his spirit. Nothing happened that he did not permit or allow. For as God in flesh, he had the authority and the power to have freed himself at any one given time if he had chosen to do so. But we thank God that he did not. Now, as we think about the cross of which Christ died, we can learn some, I believe, some valuable lessons that can help us to keep in mind and remember what our Lord did there on the cross. In just a moment, I'm going to be taking you to a message which speaks about the lessons that we can learn from the cross of Jesus Christ. Well, some of the older churches are getting rid of the cross. They don't want to put crosses at least on the outside of the building because they say that the cross is an offense to many. And we don't want to offend anyone. Therefore, we'll get rid of the cross and therefore people will feel free to be able to come into our congregation. What they fail to realize is without the cross... There is no reason to have a congregation. The cross is so very important and is such a centerpiece to us who are Christians. You know, there have been many means in many ways that man has devised to torture and to kill people over the years. Some of them I remember learning about in seminary and I can tell you right now, you don't even want to even come close to even hearing about them. But it has been said that of all the ways that man has come up and has contrived to kill a person, the cross was the epitome. And why, out of all the various ways that man has to kill individuals, did God select the cross? I believe he selected the cross because it provided the ideal vehicle for which the Lord would not only pay for our sins, but also it would be the ideal tool to serve, to teach man about what Christ was doing there upon that cross. I want to touch on four lessons that we can learn from this cross, and I hope that you'll listen and you'll gain and glean some things from this. Some of these you might be able to even use as you share the cross with others. Because truly that is our testimony and our witness, is to share with others what Jesus Christ has done for us. And of course, that has to begin at the cross. The first lesson that we can learn from all of this is to look at the material of the cross. It was the creation of Christ that would be used to crucify him. In John chapter 1, it says that not only was Christ God, but he was the creator God. He was the Genesis 1-1 God who created all things. And he created trees knowing full well that it was upon one of his own creations he would suffer. Yet he went ahead and did it anyways. It is interesting to note that it was the product of a living tree, 
that death fell upon all of mankind. We all know the account found in Genesis chapter 3 in which Adam and Eve partake of a living tree and in the process God had warned them that they would what? Die. It was only right then that God would take the product of a dead tree in order to restore life back to man. The scriptures tell us this over and over that Jesus, in a real sense, was a second Adam. He was the Adam that the first Adam should have been. And he would provide for mankind what the first Adam should have provided for mankind. For through the first Adam and the first Eve, we all died. We all talk about the various genetic things that we inherit from our parents that we're not sometimes so happy about. But I'm going to tell you right now, none of them are as bad as the one that everyone inherits. And that is a sinful, depraved, fallen, sinful nature. And it comes to us from mom and dad, who got it from mom and dad, who got it from mom and dad, who all the way back through Noah down to Adam and Eve. But just as through one man sin entered into the world, just so then also life would enter the world through one man, a second Adam. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, listen to what it says here. But now Christ is risen from the dead. Many have been questioning whether, you know, there really was going to be a resurrection from the dead. And Paul's talking about it. And Paul talks about, well, you know, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, and then he tells all the different things that could, would happen if, if that wasn't the case. But when he gets all done, he is an eyewitness of the resurrection of Christ. He has witnessed that resurrection. He has seen Jesus alive physically. And so after he deals with this wrong philosophy and this wrong teaching that, that Christ didn't rise from the dead, he then says, however, let me tell you this, Christ did rise from the dead. And having made that declaration, he goes on to say, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, everyone who dies is going to what? Rise. Hey, you know that rhymes, doesn't it? Everyone that dies is going to rise. True? You bet it is. They are, or he is, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all have died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. By the way, that all includes those who are lost. Isn't that interesting? You say, are you sure about that? Well, let's see what Jesus says about it in John chapter 5, verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming at which you are, those who are in the grave, where all who have died and are in the graves will hear his voice. And they're coming out of the grace. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, all, though, shall be restored back to life again. Because Christ rose from the dead, the power of his resurrection is so powerful that no one who dies, can possibly resist it. All should be rise, raised from the dead. The only difference will be and not the resurrection, but rather the destiny. Some will be raised to life eternal, what man was created originally to enjoy, and some will be raised to total condemnation to enjoy what Satan provided for them. 
Then they're over in Romans chapter 5. Paul once again gets waxing away on this topic again. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all his sin. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation or eternal punishment, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to some men. Whoops, I think I goofed that one up. It came to who? All men. To all men. I want you to focus on that idea, and we're going to go back to that idea in a moment. It was for all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. The second lesson we can learn from the cross is the shape of the cross. The cross is made up of two members, a vertical member and a horizontal member. The vertical member is one that has its lower section in the ground and the upper section is pointing toward the sky or toward heaven. One end then buried in the ground, the other pointing toward heaven. You know what this speaks of, I really believe? I believe God doesn't make any mistakes. And I think the cross taught a lot about Jesus and what he was doing. This vertical member speaks of the dual nature of the one who was crucified. It was buried in the ground, speaking of the fact that Jesus was truly a man, just like every one of us, physically a human being. Yet the side that points toward heaven indicates that not only was he a man, but he was also God as well. And uh, if you want some ideas along this line, you know, it's interesting. The disciples don't seem to pick up on this idea that he is God and that God is in their midst. It's only after the resurrection that they gather this idea. But what is particularly interesting is his enemies get the point. Listen to what John chapter 5, verse 16 through 19 says. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus. And they sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. He had broken Sabbath law, not God's Sabbath law, man's Sabbath law. But Jesus answered and said, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. And therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. Because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said that God was his father. In other words, I am the son of God. And by doing this, he made himself equal with God. Yeah, it's interesting. While the disciples are all hiding after Christ is put into the tomb, hiding for fear of the religious leaders and the fact that they might be next, what are the religious leaders doing? They're going to Pilate, and what are they doing? They're saying to Pilate, While this man was alive, he said he would rise three days after he died. See, they understood it. They got it. They got the point. (laughs) The sad thing was they understood it, but they didn't embrace it. And it did them no good. The horizontal member, the cross member, has its lines horizontally. And if, if we go along the horizontal line and we continue to go both directions, we will meet on the opposite part of the world. What does that speak about? It speaks about what the atoning work on the cross was designed to do. It was designed to reach all mankind, both Jews and Gentiles. Boy, Israel missed out on that one. They thought God had just come to save them. Uh Uh-uh. God came to save the whole world. The third lesson we can learn from the cross is the work of the cross. You see, the work of the cross was to carry out justice. The work of the cross was to punish criminals for the crimes that they committed. 
whether we like to admit it or not, and this is one of the greatest hurdles that mankind, fallen mankind, the lost, have to deal with. One of the greatest hurdles they have to deal with is the fact of admitting that they are criminals in God's judicial system. It's been said that uh, if you go into most prisons and you talk to most prisoners, unless they're brutally honest, they will tell you that they're in prison, but they didn't really do it. It really wasn't their fault, or they were, they're innocent. That's built into us. That's the lie that Satan fed, and that's a lie that we grow up with. We don't like to admit that we are criminals deserving of the punishment that Jesus went through, not just for three hours, but for all eternity. In a real sense, the cross that Jesus died on, and there were three crosses. You see, the Romans had planned to execute three people that day. Jesus was not one of them. The plan to execute these three criminals had been in the works for several days. These three criminals were not only rebels against Rome and against the Jews, but these individuals were thieves and murderers. They would have thought nothing of coming up behind you at night with a knife and slitting your throat and taking your wallet and whatever else you had valuable and walk away from it and not even give it a second thought. And the Jewish people hated them as well as the Romans. You say, but there were only two thieves put on the cross with Jesus. You're right. There was a third thief that was left go free. His name was Barabbas. You see, the crucifixion that the Romans had planned was Barabbas and his two compatriots. And Pilate, knowing that Jesus was innocent and not deserving of the crucifixion, thought he had finally come up with a scheme by which he could free Jesus. And he said, I'll tell you what, it's my custom to let one prisoner go free every year. He said, uh, I'll give you the choice. You can let Barabbas go free or you can let Jesus go free. And knowing how much the Jews hated Barabbas, he thought for certain that they would go with Jesus. What he didn't realize is that the Jews, particularly the religious leaders, hated Jesus more than they hated Barabbas. And Pilate said, go forth, take him out, crucify him on the cross of Barabbas, and let Barabbas go free. By the way, according to Roman law, that if such a pardon was given, in essence it virtually wiped clean your record. Barabbas was now totally free from any punishment, from any imprisonment, from any retaliation for what he had done. And in a real sense, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did on the cross for every one of us. Because it wasn't just Barabbas' cross. It was our cross that he died on. And like Barabbas... Because we have put our faith and trust in him, we have our slate of all of our crimes and sins that we've committed against God wiped clean. Look at what Romans chapter 3 tells us on this. This is wonderful. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. Here's that term again. Being justified, though, freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. Jesus Christ said, Hey, you, 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 all of you, you've committed a crime, and God's justice system has to be met. And the only way that you can go free is that the penalty has got to be paid. And Jesus said, I'll pay it. In fact, he goes on to say that he might be, that is, God the Father, might be the just and the justifier 
of the one who has faith in Jesus our Lord. You see, we're justified. The price has been paid. We've been pardoned. We now go free. But look at the cost in order to be able to set us free. It is also that work of the cross and education to the masses that the ordeal of these crimes and the death that they agonized and suffered through all point to the severity of sin of each and every one of us and how God views the sin. Too often times we as human beings view our sin in accordance to the sin of others and we look at others and we look at ourselves and we say, you know what, I'm not near the sinner they are. So what? In God's eyes, we are vile, refless, r- 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 vile, unprofitable people apart from what Jesus Christ can do. Finally, the fourth lesson is the vacancy of the cross. The original cross is gone, by the way. I know that many uh, Catholics believe that they still have uh, splinters of the original cross. Somebody once predict, figured it up that all the splinters that are located in various churches around the world that are supposedly splinters of the cross, if they were all added together, you could build several houses with them. I don't believe that The cross really meant anything to the Romans or the Jews or the disciples. The disciples would have had no say over the cross. The cross probably was used over and over and over to the point it wore out and it was and therefore probably thrown into the valley of Gehenna and burned and consumed. But that empty, vacant cross means a lot to us. Because what it means is that when Jesus was finished with that vehicle of atonement, he declared it as such. You know, we differ from a certain group that has cross with Jesus still on it. They believe Jesus' work isn't finished. Jesus must be re-crucified. Listen to what the Bible says, though. John 19, verse 25. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished... The scriptures might be fulfilled. Then drop down to verse 30. He said, it is what? Finished. The work's done. I've completed it. All I've got left to do, piece of cake. Raised from the dead. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. It is vacant as well, because the cross was not the end of life for the victim, but rather it was the beginning of life in this case. As we look at the cross, let us be reminded of the fact that God uses the tree as a teaching tool. Next time you see some of your unbelieving friends and so forth, ask them a question. Say uh, to them, did you realize that it is the product of the tree that caused all men to sin and it was the product of the tree that provides salvation for everyone? Use it as a jumping off tool to share the gospel with others. As we look at the cross, let us remember what the cross has accomplished. It has provided fellowship between us and God. It has provided us eternal life. We shall never die forever. We have a hope. We have the hope that Jesus had when he died. He said, just wait three days. This is not permanent. This is temporary. I'll be back. And so it will be true of every one of us who leads this life prior to the coming of our Lord. Don't grieve for me. Grieve for yourselves. But don't grieve too much. This is only temporary. I'll be back. So it is with everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. As we look at the cross, let us remember our true need and what Christ paid to do it. And in doing so, be thankful for him. And as we look at the cross, let us remember of the great hope that we now have. The hope of the resurrection. 
Father, I pray that you be with those who have listened to this sermon tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless them in every way, but especially those who know not you as Savior. May you speak to their hearts, convict them of the fact that this is not some fairy story. This is not some make-believe thing or a myth, but it is the truth, the reality of what actually took place. And may they make that decision today. And we pray this in your name. Amen.